So um, welcome, uh, welcome Athenistas to Google um, uh, for today's talks at Google. It, it's interesting uh, that both of our companies, which are technology companies in the 21st century, actually have names for our employees, Athenistas and Googlers. Um, and hopefully some of the Athenistas and some of the Googlers will, will mix it up here today. Um, we're here today for talks at Google with Jonathan Bush. Um, well, it's all right if we can have, you know, the, the ratio doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, school year abroad, we'll just yeah, think yeah. of it in an exchange program. Um, <laughs> the, um, so we're here to talk with uh, Jonathan Bush, uh, whose book just came out, Where Does It Hurt? An Entrepreneur's Guide to Fixing Healthcare. Um, I, I was just speaking with one of uh, Jonathan's associates who asked me if I was familiar with the book, and I've actually read the book, okay? Ooh. And in fact, you could actually see some notes in the margins. Did you read it on it. paper, too? I read it on paper, yes. Wow. I actually read this on a plane. There's still some left, a, people. <laughs> this is what they look like. Yeah. Um, so Jonathan is, um, in addition to the author of this book, which I recommend highly, it's, uh, it, it really does make a very, very complicated topic uh, much easier to understand. It also makes a very complicated topic possibly very scary for some of us who haven't seen all our way through it. But um, in addition to being a soon-to-be best-selling author, Jonathan's also the uh, president, um, CEO, and chairman of uh, Athena Health, uh, which he co-founded in 1997. Uh, he took public in 2007 when it was the most successful IPO of the year. Uh, and continues to thrive and grow today in 2014. Um, yes, were you going to say something? Well, that's I said, what I do when I'm feeling full of myself. I just oh, do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But um, we're not going to necessarily talk deeply about the business today, although we'll get to that. We'd like to talk about the book, which is just as much the Jonathan story and the healthcare story as it is the Athena Health uh, story. So, um, Jonathan. I'll start you off with a kind of a, a, a life of Jonathan question. Um, you graduated from Wesleyan, uh, the College of Social Studies. Is that yes. correct? Um, how does a graduate of Wesleyan College, or what does a person do when they graduate from, the, from Wesleyan and the College of Social Studies to work their way to this? You know, yeah. what, what was the path? What were some of the motivations? What were some of the inspirational epiphany moments that happened then, right after, then, right before then, that eventually got you to 1997. Well, I, I think I'll go a little bit earlier. And Great. I was actually, I, I was one of the few people to receive early rejection okay. from a college. <laughs> okay. So that's where you apply early and they don't defer you to the general admission pool. They say, wow, you are so far off in terms of your goals that we're going to help you by saying that you'll never come here. Okay. And uh, then you can go back to your Was that Wesleyan? College. That was Wesleyan. Okay. Uh, which, of course, immediately to me was like, I'm coming there. Okay. Uh, and so I took a year off, and I went to BU, and I got good grades, which was exhausting, the good grades, but I, I did it. Uh, and then I came back, and I got in. And, uh, and I really wasn't, after all that effort getting good grades, I realized I wasn't really uh, good at anything. Uh, at anything. I, wa I wasn't good at sports, and I wasn't good at math, and I wasn't good at science, and I wasn't good at literature. But I liked all of it. And uh, I liked the idea of being a little better at all of it. And the College of Social Studies was an interdisciplinary program. Okay. It was history, government, economics, and philosophy, and little colloquia that you'd go through intensively. And I it would intensively do, did a bad job at all of them. But there were only a few of us that would dare try to take all of those on. Right. Uh, and it worked wonders for my dyslexia. And, and it gave me an incredible competence at, at seeing the broad stroke of things. And that's why, you know, Wesleyan's president just wrote a book on, you know, why liberal education is useful in an era of, you know, comp sci and math. Right. And, 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 uh, and it's about seeing the broad stroke of things. Uh, and in healthcare, that's particularly hard to do. In fact, there are years and years of well-intentioned law making it almost illegal to see the broad stroke of what's happening in, sure. in healthcare. So that's how it got started. And it was, in fact, the idea of looking for places where there was no broad stroke that made sense that got me to healthcare. Um, and so Wesleyan was, was perfect training, who knew? Also, I was the absolute best Wesleyan graduate at healthcare management, because there were no other Wesleyan graduates anywhere interested in the management of healthcare. Great, so you, you finished up at Wesleyan, and you, you had a couple of adventures, mm. right? That, that actually started yes. to get you closer to this. Right, it was, I graduated with Wesleyan, still clinging to the idea that maybe there was something that I could be good at. 
And since the idea of making a lot of money saving people's lives appealed, and no one else in my family had been a doctor except for my uncle Johnny, who was then 80 and had polio, and so I couldn't, he couldn't compete with me. Right. Um, <laughs> I thought maybe I'd be a doctor and I'd, you know, be like, you know, it was before ER, but it would be like ER and I'd save people's lives and be Marcus romantic. Welby, yeah. yeah. Some of us were really. Um, and then I learned about this whole uh, organic chemistry thing. And, and there went that. Uh, but but before, I, before I discovered organic chemistry, I, a doctor friend, I said, look, I want to do this doctor thing. And he's a trauma surgeon. He was, you know, worked on the president's rescue squad that flew around the world case the president got shot. And he said, look, try before you buy. I have a friend who's the police surgeon in New Orleans. Get a job. Get your EMT certification and, and get a job treating patients. Um, and, and then decide if you want to put seven years of your life into being bad at school again. And, uh, and I did, and I didn't. And I'm really glad I didn't go all the way through medical school and, and had this experience. But I absolutely loved driving an ambulance from 6 at night to 6 in the morning in New Orleans. It was the greatest experience, I think, probably in my career to date, including everything that's happened at Athena, uh, partly because of the romance of being sort of honored with the one thing that is going truly horribly wrong amongst a million people. You know, right now, amongst the 5 million people in Massachusetts, there's some horrible thing happening. And to be the one entrusted to help in that moment and be allowed to race to that place is, is, is romantic and important and beautiful. But also, the whole system, you get, to, you get to travel through the whole food chain from the back room of the house all the way through the emergency room and into the operating room and see all the handoffs, which, if you like the broad stroke of things, provides an extraordinary uh, front row seat and really inspiring business ideas come, come out of that. And, you know, one business idea was, wow, EMTs do things better than doctors. You know, paramedics can put in lines and, and, and tubes better than doctors because we do them all the time in a moving ambulance with someone who's trying to kick us. And that's, that's really good practice for being able to get it right. Another idea, so, you know, can't we downskill? Can't we create different specializations below doctor and make care cheaper? That was an idea that came out of it, went into Athena Women's Health. Another one was most of the people we treated in an ambulance didn't need to be transported. They needed a little bit of stabilization, a little bit of help, a little bit of emotional support. And we weren't allowed to do that. If we, if we didn't transport them, we'd get no money. If we did transport them, we'd get $495. So treating in place remains an enormous business opportunity for somebody who likes that stuff. And that's what got me going on this whole, how does the whole thing fit together? How could it fit together differently idea? Great. Um, that was followed by as we refer to it here in Cambridge, the B School. And, the Temple uh, of Capitalism, the, yeah. yeah. Okay, the Temple of Capitalism, if we didn't catch that on the mic. Sorry. And, um, and, uh, and consulting, right? Uh, uh, Booz Allen, yeah. yeah. There, another opportunity to fail again at something. Uh, so I was able to get into the business school about seven minutes before the meeting where they were going to sit me down and talk about how it's not working. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, I just was with the spreadsheets and the footnotes and getting it all right. That was terrible. Okay. Um, I loved the problems we were solving, but once I saw what the answer was, the seven months of billing for p PowerPoint analysis of it all just was torturous. I think probably a lot of people come to Google for that reason instead of going to these. Um, or, or they've perhaps made a stop there and end up here. That's as you right. said, they've made yeah. a stop there and they right. end up here. We definitely have a lot, a lot of those folks here, yeah. as, you, as you imagined. Um, so then the time comes to, to start a business. Inspiration. Um, uh, market I identifying a market opportunity, yeah. inspiration. Uh, Athena Health starts as yeah. Well, it's st it, it started as a series of women, uh, 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 women's health, an alternative to maternity care, a holistic approach to uh, maternity care, and uh, took all the things I learned uh, as an ambulance driver, as an army medic was even more extreme examples of delegation uh, down below the MD level, uh, and became very clear. I did the work at business school, you know. Harvard Business School is great because people call you back. So I'm doing research at Harvard Business School. Oh, maybe I'll call him. You know, call him back. Sort of like I'm calling from Google. You know, ooh, you know, I'll I'll call that guy back. Um, and built a model that showed that I mean some breakthrough insights like not everybody who's pregnant is also sick, uh, but in the United States everybody who's pregnant gets treated like they're sick, like they're just about to blow <laughs> any moment. When in fact it's a thing. In fact, the first doctor turns out to have been the subject of a perfectly healthy pregnancy. 
Um, that's a joke, because the doctor was Yes. A, okay. uh, <laughs> and, and so the idea of matching health advocates to healthy women and to help fewer of them actually end up in need of a doctor, and then matching doctors to unhealthy women, and therefore those women got the benefit of a better doctor who's actually spending all of her time with sick moms, uh, created better doctors, much lower cost of care, and it was great except we ran it into the ground because we couldn't get paid. We couldn't figure out all of the various accounting, get the hospital information and the lab and the pharmacy and the anesthesiologist and the neonatologist all in one picture. Uh, we couldn't even get our own claims paid because there was no code for a nutritionist doing a visit instead of a midwife, even though the exact right person to do it was a midwife, so can uh, you, a nutritionist, et cetera. So can you just slow down on that point yeah. for just a second? The, the year is what when this is happening? This was the, 97 through 99. 97 through 99. Um, explain again how you had trouble getting paid. Yeah. Um, for, you know, again, this, uh, a lot of folks in this audience will understand that, but this, this video will be posted on YouTube. Right. We have 220,000, excuse me, 208,000 subscribers to that YouTube channel. Right. Um, and so while they'll be very thoughtful people, um, they may need a little bit more. Yeah, sure. So you guys on the street, you ever get a, like a bill in the mail from a visit, and it's got the thing you tear off in the envelope, and then it says, this is not a bill? <laughs> you ever get one of those, like from a lab, like LabCorp or whatever, and you're like, it says amount due and everything, but it says this is not a bill. And you're like, well, what do I do? Or an EOB for your kids, and it's got lots of little rows and columns and codes, and you're like, so what do I do? Doctors, they do that. That's all. It's like filing your taxes every day. That's what it's like being a doctor. Everybody you see, everything you do has to be defended, has to be charged for in one of 7,000 different what's called CPT, procedure codes. And then the procedure codes need to be defended by one of 10,000, soon going to 140,000 different ICD diagnostic codes. And then you have to write little bits that explain why those were the right diagnostic codes. And then you file your taxes, file your claim, and you get this payment. Well, that is exhausting if you do it exactly the way everyone else does it. But if you try to mix it up and do a bundle of things that aren't normally bundled together, or use somebody that isn't the doctor that usually does it, the coding and defending and documenting and tax filing energy goes right up to 11. And, and that's what Athena ran into. And that's what everybody in healthcare runs into. I want to do it better. I want to do it different. And then they find out what it takes to just do it at all, and they get bogged down. Right? The, the, the notion of a, of a healthcare cloud, of just like Google, where, I mean, I don't know the age, but the amazingness of Google is hard to put into words. That You just put the words into the box, and it pretty much gives you the thing you're looking for. That's redonkulous. I mean, that's amazing, right? I, I don't get it, but it's awesome. And what, Healthcare doesn't have, now healthcare is more difficult. There's security issues and there's privacy issues and there's complexity issues that make that just crawling what's out there not sufficient. But it seems like we were thinking at the time, God, it would be great if some of this muck could just be crawled and handled and linked in the background. And I could say in English what I did or what I want to do and why, and then whoever needs to speak claims-ish, uh, you know, or filing-ish, can, can translate it through Google Translator and tell whichever claims system that needs to know. And that was where Athena, it was, the, it was the idea of not being able to sufficiently code for, get paid for, exchange information around what we were doing that caused us to start to build our own cloud. We couldn't afford the enterprise software that was available. We had a, my co-founder's younger brother was president of the Harvard Computer Club. They were like the technical support people that, you know, that you could pay to join at Harvard. And he got two of his friends, and they came out for the summer. And this was in San Diego? Yeah. And, yeah. and they, we, was all, we were all living in these two flop houses where we all took little spaces of carpet. It's really good wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. So we just thought, you know, it's so clean. That, that's Let's a just, 90s thing, too. Yeah, yeah. use yeah. it. And yeah. it was great. And there was you know, amazing taquerias. So we didn't, yeah. the food was fine. Good. And, uh, We'll get and to why you ever left in a, in a it bit. It was tough. I bet. It was I tough. Bet. Okay. If it wasn't for my then wife saying she'd leave me, which she did anyway, 10 years later, <laughs> uh, I'd still be there. Uh, for good reason. I'm a workaholic. Uh, but wow, 
you know, amazing experience. And what, we, what he started to say, what our CTO and what other guys started to say is, look, you, we should just write this. We should just write this ourselves. We were downloading stuff into like Microsoft you know, access tables and pivoting and figuring out what we needed to report to whom that way. But after a while, I was like, why can't we just write this? You know, and so we started writing a little applet that crawled the state Medicaid website in California. It's called Medi-Cal to see if people's like they'd put in different screen scrape, different names or numbers that we had from our front desk and see if we could figure out if they were covered that month for, for state assistance. And then we started figuring out how to automatically add the modifiers that you have to use to do the same coding when it's a midwife seeing the patient instead of a doctor. And little by little by little, sort of in the, what we now call lean development, but at the time we called just fix one more thing, development, uh, it started to sort of grow like wall mold through different parts of the practice. And pretty soon, even though I had said, you know, I went to the temple of capitalism, I know the theory of comparative advantage, we're a healthcare company, not a technology company, therefore we will buy our technology and, you know, and, uh, and, tr and trade uh, and, and build our healthcare service experience. Um, it just happened. You know, the wonderful thing about Pearl and, and, and internet coding and the, the lean development process that is allowed in that we can talk about the software enabled service business right. model um, is it almost takes on a life of its own. It almost starts to, it's so easy for so many people to see the problem and it's so easy to solve it and it's so hard to stop them from solving the problem that it sort of just goes at the pace of the imagination as opposed to we're going to have a plan, we're going to march out, we're going to set out, we're going to climb the hill, and then we're all going to do it at the end of the year. We're going to have another plan. It's more of a jazz band than an orchestra. So, um, so the business model essentially changes from a service. That's right. Uh, a, we a, decided that we were too far ahead, that we, that we were a business that needed a healthcare cloud to exist. And so what we were going to do is build the healthcare cloud. We were going to build, so we changed the vision statement of the company. It was Athena Women's Health is going to be a management information, uh, what is it, will be a management uh, a management infrastructure that helps make women's health work as it should. And we swi switched it to Athena Health, not Athena Women's Health, will be an information infrastructure that helps make healthcare work as it should. Great. Uh, and once we did that, we were opened up to selling to anybody. And they didn't have to use our unique model. They could be any way they wanted as long as they wanted to connect. And that that connection fabric would somehow, someday be the, the substrata that people could then build businesses on top of. And sure enough, the book is exciting because that was this ridiculous idea 16, 15 years ago to try to keep people from quitting. I'm like, wait, no, no, you don't understand. Because then we're gonna, it's gonna be like this substrat, and then there's gonna be all these Athena women's health that are built on top, and they're like, okay, look, I won't quit for another month, but stop with the talk about the stuff. And here's, you know, whatever there are in the book. We, I mean, there's tons of them, but there's like five or six in the book that have folks that have actually done that. So it's actually happening. Right. Um, so talk a little bit about actually now building a new technology company. Yeah. Maybe a little bit, because I mean, in, in the crowd here, we probably have, even though you'd like all of them to work for Athena forever, it, um, and we'd like all the Googlers to work at Google forever, yeah. they won't because they're smart, they're young, they're ambitious, they'll have their own ideas. You're getting so, very big, it's scary. Uh, yeah. Talk a little bit about what it was like to actually yeah. build this new company. Maybe we should throw in your question about the software enabled and, and services. And so I'll, I'll make it a two-parter okay. about software enabled services. Right. And so essentially the concept of building this new company in what is a new category. Right. Not SaaS, but software enabled services. Right. What do you mean by that? And yep. then how did you build that? So we, we, didn't, we named it in retrospect because what we wanted to point out to people was that we were not SaaS. So you, yeah. You have the, if you think about, if you go to like the Science Museum to the Paleolithic exhibit, you know, way back in the Cro-Magnon era, there's enterprise software. Where you pay millions of dollars and you receive what amounts to a disk. And then you buy machines and you have consultants, which are these three-legged, you know, with hunches that come and, you know, burn in stuff and, you know, load up stuff and download stuff. And, and then they have classes where people come to learn how to follow the ritual of that particular Enterprise software. And then there are ASPs that come after that, and these are where they have professional consultants where you don't have to buy them, they just are always there backing it up and hosting it and doing the downloads, and you just pay a little more every month. And then suddenly, you know, in comes in a chariot, you know, Mark Benioff and, and, and you guys, although you guys have a way cooler business model, but companies that say, listen, 
I'm going to just have one copy of this thing up in the world, native on the internet. And if you like it the way it is, you can come and use it. And you're not going to have to get trained on it. It's not going to be installed or downloaded. And if you've been using it for a while, I'm going to start to charge you. Or I'm going to start to sell, you know, I'm going to start to show you stuff that you didn't ask for so that I can charge someone else. Either way. And, and so it's a tool that is used by people to either service themselves or service others native on the internet, right? right? And then the break from there, which sort of the muse for me is, is Bezos, and, but we sort of view ourselves as sort of an industrial strength, narrower, deeper Amazon, is that the software, the tool is no longer the product. It's not the monetizable thing. It's just the store into which you go to get the service. So Amazon sells the arrival of stuff in your life, either shipped to you, hovercrafted to you, or squirted to your Kindle, right? And when you get that stuff, a little piece of it goes to Jeffrey, right? And he's a peaceful man. He just wants a little piece of everything in the world. And uh, God bless him. But what it does is it changes his business model, because now he's not only in charge of making his software work, right? He's making sure that people actually use his software in a way that he desires and get outcomes that they desire. In, in order to monetize, right? So Athena, you know, anybody can use Athena, and we don't charge you until you get a claim paid, or a chart filed, or a patient in your office. It is the event, it is the work being done that generates the revenue. And so if we use the internet, or carrier pigeons, or 2,000 people in India data entering paper forms that the insurance company just can't seem to give us electronically, that's all good. It can be. It can be knowledge, it can be software, and it can be bone-crushing work, forklifts included. Uh, the, as long as the result gets got, the revenue is driven. And that idea opens up so much of the pre-internet world to uh, new businesses. And, and you know, we found one, but there, there are countless others. And that idea of a software-enabled service was, and the way it started for us is, we started as a service that didn't even want software. Right? We said, look, we want a piece of your profits as a women's health practice. And they said, sure. And then we said, OK, how about a piece of your revenues as any practice? And little by little, we keep designing our products around a piece of the success, whatever success is defined as, a little piece of it, which liberates us to do the kind of lean development that a SaaS company can do, but add non-software, non-technology arms and legs around it to make it go faster. Great. So you. you Sp speak glowingly of uh, enterprise software um, early on when you were describing this yes. course. Y you're well, in its time, you know, back in the day. <laughs> glowingly. Yeah. Um, you, it ruled, but you, it ruled but you, the jungle. But you're, do you, are you competing with, that could be. It's an 800 right number, so it's not for me. Um, I, I, how do you view Epic and Cerna today as a, competitor as an opportunity. Look, I think a, those I are really well run, fabulous companies of another era, you know. And and that era I sort of see as over, but I get to sit, you know, at the um, sort of theoretical helm of this incredibly ambitious uh, visionary group of people that are, you know, constantly pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, and not every hospital is sitting at the helm of such a such a ship and so something safe that's of an era that they understand, you know, we're Parking places are part of your comp packet, you know, yeah. with a little name on it, you know, and like think about hospitals, right? So a safe thing that's been going on for years that uses the same ecosystem of consultants and specialists and vendors and, you know, allows the same career paths that have always been there. You know, I'm going to be the CIO of a hospital and there's a special trade association for them. And it's hard to imagine letting all of that go uh, until it's very, very, very safe. Um, there's that wonderful book, Crossing the Chasm, about you know, an invention is amazing and it works. And the early adopters who would happily you know, deal with all the warts of a new invention make you feel like you finally cracked the code. And then you get to your mainstream customers and you're like, Jesus, this is a mess. You know, I hate this. And you have to go through this horrible chasm of making your new age thing work as reliably as the old age did. And, 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 and healthcare is that way. So we're having to get through to a place where the safety that people associate with Cerner and Epic 
which, is, which are not safe. Their, their systems are down you know, 10, 20, 30 times more than ours are. Um, and none of the systems correlate to performance. The, Epic doesn't lose money if, you lose your, if they lose your claims or if you lose your claims on Epic. They don't lose money if your doctors don't document their charts. They, there's no correlation between your performance and their performance like there is with Athena. But still, that, that's a scary step. And, uh, you know, I, and I think you know, so was electricity, and we seem to all be okay with that yeah, at this sure. point. So was the internet. We seem to be banging away on that. So, Do you find that you're getting traction with the concept of software enabled as opposed to SaaS? For those who, you know, for the, uh, for the elites that are listening to this YouTube, I think they get it. Okay. Uh, so when, we, when, when one of our salespeople gets in front of somebody and ex explains the difference, it's easy. Um, the word cloud helps people. So thank God Microsoft spent all that money for everybody on the cloud ads. Let's go to the cloud, kids. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, you know, the idea of somebody who's actually going to look out for your particular stuff uh, in a space, the iCloud, th that helped. Because people, now those things don't work at the level of security and fidelity that AthenaNet does. Shouldn't have to for your photos or your whatever. But, but the fact that, that at least it's a term that people can grok, can, can start to get a hold of. And that's helping us. And you know, Hippocrates, uh, which every doctor understands uh, and, and half of doctors use every day, uh, Helps as well. Talk more about that because some of the audience may not be aware that you guys acquired Hippocrates. We, we did. What do they do? Why did you acquire them? How is it playing out? Uh, Hippocrates is the best known and loved, in terms of net promoter score, uh, brand in the world of practicing physicians. So that's what we love the most about it. Uh, we also love all the things that they have done over the last 15 years to earn that love. I like the way they think and operate. Uh, it is a decision support tool. It's a read-only app that a doctor whips out in the moment of care and says, I'm going to raise your dose because this one's not working, but I just want to check to make sure that, you know, this works on men the way I think it does or at your weight or, you know, whether the on-brand, whether the off-brand generic is just as effective. Little questions that they're not familiar with because they're not doing that prescription enough that they know it cold, they'll check it. It, there was a thing called the Physician Desk Reference back in the day, which was this book, and they'd say, just one minute, and they'd go out and you know, make sure they weren't killing you with the wrong dose. Well, Hippocrates is sort of a living, breathing, interactive version of that. Uh, and it gives, us every, it gives us half the doctor's eyeballs in the country on a very regular basis. And uh, it gives us the opportunity to use the plumbing that we've been building. There are now 100,000 connections between AthenaNet and legacy systems, labs, pharmacies, hospitals, that, and, and more being built every day. Uh, and, and now Hippocrates can start to be wired up like your Xfinity remote or back in that day, remember the first time you sent an email off your BlackBerry and there it was in your Outlook account and you're like, that was awesome. I didn't even like do a cable and it's there. That opportunity to just stop going into these bowel-based enterprise software products and, and, but, but still have them, if the hospital's gonna be stuck on them, to be able to drive them, like your Xfinity remote can change your channel if you work at Google and you actually can figure out how to do it. Um, that idea is, 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 uh, is the potentiality for us of, of Hippocrates. So, um, working two expectations to date? Um, uh, half and half, so they've done, what they've done to earn the trust and loyalty of uh, physicians, they continue to do. If bombs were going off, if the Syrians were taking over San Francisco, they would still be doing it, you know, with barrel bombs going off. Um, they, uh, they have not made money. Um, and so we have to help them with that is a good thing. Okay. Uh, that's the one thing. And we will. Uh, okay. We will because Great. otherwise we'll die and then we'll all be uh, out of a job. But, but I, I think we can do it. It's not going to be hard. What's the... What's the uh, sort of like saying gravity is a thing. Like, y you need the revenue and... Right. Is there a next big hurdle for Athena Health? Oh There's so many hurdles. Well, what's right? the next biggest, most? Well, I mean, this is a two focused. trillion dollar mess. Just a, nobody understands it. Doctors don't understand it. Everybody feels. And I want to say this: the, the thing about healthcare that gets me is not how expensive it is. That gets me a little, but really, kind of, just cuts at me, is that for all that money now taken by force of law, you're not, you can't opt out. It really isn't an expression of our humanity. You know, think about everything, what we're wearing, where we work, where we travel, whether we travel, who we date. Everything we do with our personal power is a way of tricking ourselves out and being a person. 
and we can change it if we don't like it. And we do many times before we die, right? Somehow healthcare, you just take it. You just pay for it, it gets taken out of your check like taxes, and then you just get this experience that you don't like. Or that you do, but it's, it's a pleasant surprise. It's not like you're in charge and they're jumping to get to you. They're not doing product management to be more appealing. When you see research, you know, 85% of Medicare beneficiaries don't receive their Medicare wellness visit. All the research talks about, you know, these idiot Medicare beneficiaries. I'm like, you mean my parents? Like, well, maybe your wellness visit sucks. How about that? Like, why don't you do it more interesting than you do it? Why don't you explain what happened in a way that's fun? Why don't you do product management the way other businesses do? Um, and I totally forgot how I got on this tangent. Oh, Next. so everything in healthcare, if connected and analyzed, could start to have a demand curve in it, could start to be a something that could do better with product management and good pricing and do worse without it. And that would be amazing. So insurance companies need to be kind of threatened with extinction. Uh, all the cost management and the accounting firms and all these guys who are doing these one-off little spreadsheets and mailing them to the doctors about their taxes need to be threatened with extinction. All of these manual, isolated, kind of guild-like, well, only I understand all the rules. Only I can speak to Oz. You know, all of those guys need to be threatened with extinction with some kind of product. Even if it's a piece of crap, low-end, disruptive product, at least it wakes people up to the idea that maybe, you know, like you guys are doing travel and movies, and you're sort of nipping. Like, it's not quite, I don't use you for the movies, but maybe I do a little sometimes just to piss off Fandango. You know, like I just want to... I love that everywhere there's somebody nipping at the heels of these guilds, making sure they're earning the right for these I'm unique, only I understand, only I can speak to Oz pricing and, and, and performance. And so that, I mean, health insurance, laboratories, pharmacies, inpatient care, home nursing care, self-care. Like we got nothing going on in self-care. Why aren't our Fitbits connected to our charts? Why don't our doctor wake up when we're behind? Or why don't we get a really serious discount when we do actually run every day for six months instead of a stupid exploding thing on the Nike app. Yeah. Like, yay, pew, Nike likes me. <laughs> and you've paid them a lot to like you. Yeah, right, for 150 bucks, <laughs> yeah. I'll like you too, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'd like some real money. I'm spending real money. I mean, yeah. look at our employees, I, mean, I don't know, 20 million bucks. That's, I know for you guys, that's valet tips at the Google garage. But for us, 20 million bucks is a ton of money to spend on something that we make people, you have to pay it. You know, and uh, you know, no matter whether you like it, like, ah, yeah, it's, it doesn't feel good. You know, if it's expensive and amazing, eh, okay. You know, we're rich. We're a rich company. Let the country. We're a rich company. Let's. But if it's rich and lame, it sucks. Uh, I'm going to come back to the industry in just a second. Yeah. But I want to get back to the journey for just a moment. Yeah. You had beautiful, soft shag carpets, taquerias, but you're in came. You're in Watertown now. Yeah. Why, why move the company here? Well, we, we, we founded the company at 94 Codman Road. Um, there's a temple built there now, you know, okay. a beautiful. Okay, so there's an apple tree, uh, which I planted. Um, and they haven't cut down. But okay. it's a ranch house uh, by the Codman Farm in Lincoln. And it was a split level. So down the split was the World HQ of Athena Health and the washer and dryer. And uh, up the split was the home of the Bush family. And then in the yard was the conference center, which was a Jeep Wagoneer where we kept flip charts, a big paper with the markers. And then we'd have meetings on the, we'd drop the gate down, you know. Um, and then when we got, we was like, well, let's just get a local medical group that we can work on as our alpha site. And none of them listened, none of them, like, absolutely not. We're not going to let you touch anything, get, you know, go away. Uh, and then we found a bunch of kooks. I had to actually miss my accounting exam at Harvard Business School. I went to the guy and I said, I, have to, I don't want to fail your course, but I will if I have to because I have to be out of town for your final. He said, what on earth would make you want to do that? I said, well, it's the only time of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists convention in Vegas. He said, you know, I've been teaching for 30 years and I had thought <laughs> up until this moment that I had heard everything, but that, and, and he let me, it was before cell phones, you know, he let me take the exam in his house in Belmont, put me in a taxi and said, okay, go to the airport, don't talk to anyone. And, uh, and I went and I found basically the only obstetricians in, that were in the right combination of sort of brilliant visionary status and about to go out of business, uh, where they would let a bunch of guys who shared laptops for saving, to save money, like, hey, can I use the laptop, you know, yeah. uh, to take them over. 
and we raised the amount of money that we would need to basically populate their accounts receivable from angel investors. So we did that all. Our world headquarters was 94 Codman, but the group happened to be in San Diego. So it was like San Diego or nobody. And since we fancied ourselves a global, you know, a national chain of women's health birth centers, who cares where your first one is? Because we were going to migrate pods. There were going to be pods. We'd buy six doctors in every market and then hire hundreds of midwives and nutritionists around them and doulas. Um, and uh, so it was like, what's the difference? Uh, so we went for six months, and it was really in bad shape after six months. But we said, we have to declare victory because if we don't get another pod soon, we won't, we're going to run out of the money. Right. And, uh, and no one will give us more money when, we're, when the, there's flames in the waiting room and everybody's unhappy. And so that's We've, um, I, I just want to talk for a minute about the local market. Um, again, for people who might be pursuing their own dreams at some point. Yeah. We've had... Um, Bill Hellman from Greylock in here to talk. Great guy. Yeah, to talk about uh, the local Great market. Great guy. Greylock dumped me. Would not, would not put the money in. Oh, I send I him my quarterly, I send him my, <laughs> my quarterly every quarter. Okay. Um, Thinking of I, you. I did not know that. Yeah. I did not know he's that. Actually, he's actually invited me to speak to his annual partners meeting. Okay. Uh, and in the spirit of humility, uh, he's going to have me go through play by play all the times I tried to go to Greylock and got shown the Heisman. Okay. Good guy, Bill. But he's, fabulous. We, we had, and we, fabulous we, front. Yeah. Front. We, 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 he, we spoke a lot about the, uh, the local um, environment as a place to start and grow a business. Do you have a view on this, this market? I share today? Bill's view, but I like, I love the story of Briar Fox and the Briar Patch. You know, don't throw me in the Briar Patch, you know. And then if you learn how to be in the Briar Patch, you win in the Briar Patch, right? This is the Briar Patch. It's got regular, it's the most business unfriendly, bureaucratic, up in the nose, sort of attitude emporium. But you got a huge amount of intellect, a huge amount of capital, and a huge amount of problem to solve. Like the cost of health care here is off the charts, the amount of financial management that goes on wastefully here is off the charts. And so if you choose a briar patch business plan that isn't sort of invent something really neat and go instantly viral really fast, this is a bad place for that. But if you choose a thorny, messy place that's going to take a lot of work, this is a great place. Because you get all these, I mean, we get amazing resumes from people at Partners Health that's, you know, that are brilliant people, that are passionate, that work long hours, that could grok you know, technology as well as anybody at Google or Athena. But they thought that, <laughs> tell me if you know any of these people, Krishna, uh, who are like, this isn't change, this is not the world changing thing I thought it was. I'm trolling the halls, you know, it's political. I'm not sure that I'm being as efficacious as I thought I would be. It's not like I thought it would be, and yet I still want to be part of healthcare, and we can hoover those people up uh, and, and use them. So it's a, it's a great place for intellect uh, and for passion, for social mission. You know, it's not a place where it's like quick, happy-go-lucky, virally explode across anything. But if you, if you want to be down in a hard trench for a long time, then I think it's really good. And, and the fact that Hellman's disappointed is kind of perfect. No, right? he, he actually speaks very highly of oh, the market. Oh, good. He speaks very highly he of the market. He told me when he cried once to me. Like, uh, he, he, oh, he, my partners in San Francisco thinks, are making all the money, and I'm supposed to be at the helm of the ship. I can't get anybody to do anything great here. He, uh, well, I think that's the challenge. He spoke to He thinks that the, the potential is yes. all here, but we, we haven't. Right. right well, what he has to do and what the next generation of entrepreneurs has to do is, you know, hats off to the Google guys and the fact that they went, you know, you ever read that book, uh, Nick, Nicholas Talib Nassim, uh, uh, Black Swan? No, about I, extremist I, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, they went from zero to a billion to a Google, you know, really fast, right? And there are those business plans, and San Francisco is tuned. When one of those pops, they're ready. They know how to go that way. It's like the movie Wag the Dog in its description of the movie industry. Like, they know who to call, and everyone knows what to do, and it all comes together. Boston is not that. But the next generation of successful businesses aren't going to go from zero to a Google. There'll be those every once in a while. One will go off and you'll see it, boom. You know? But there'll be a lot of really, really fast compared to old-fashioned companies, but really, really slow compared to instant viral companies. Yeah. And that's where I think the sweet spot of Boston is. Yeah, and I think, that, not to misrepresent Bill, he, again, potential. We just beat the crap out of poor Bill. Yeah, capital, <laughs> intellect. Yeah, culture lacking. That's it. And particularly a mentoring culture. And, a mentoring and that's right. And mentoring lacking. and a social mission culture. Yeah. There, 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 is a, there is a very, it's, it's, it's a little bit narcissistic and it's, and, and it's extremely um, mercenary. 
in San Francisco. It's quick and it's, it's no hard feelings. It's great because it's failure friendly. It's like, yep, I tried. I'm going to pick up my sleeping bag and my, you know, port a fridge. I'm going to go to another startup and do it again and I'll either be a billionaire or I'll be picking up my fridge and going somewhere else. And it's fine. And that mercenariness is good for a lot of businesses. And we've done so much with the internet because of those mercenary businesses that don't mind failing and don't mind regenerating. But there is another sector, what I would call the fiduciary sector, which has been over-regulated, right? As soon as we care too much about Baby Precious, we let Baby Precious get fat and he's spoiled and he cries and we give him whatever he wants because we're afraid he'll get upset. And we've got a bunch of sectors of our society that are like that, transportation and auto and, 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 and financial services and healthcare. We're, you know, be fat, incompetent, you know, oh, but I need a subsidy. You know, no, you don't. You need to die. <laughs> and, and, and we need to get your people out and put them to work in real companies. But they're social goods. They're quasi-social goods. And we are afraid of hurting our safety net. And so we, for good reasons, create sclerosis or moats around them. And, 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 and we can still do it. We can still, you know, this book talks about ways of doing it in healthcare. It can be done in transportation. It can be done in education. It can be done in law enforcement. All these places that are hyper-regulated and overprotected, And therefore, when you watch them operate from the outside, when you're used to the Google way of moving people through the office or, or doing anything, you're like, I would shoot myself on my third day at the police department watching the way they have to do a report downtown when they show up at a traffic accident or whatever, right? Yeah. And so those opportunities are, are waiting for us to sort of infiltrate and go more slowly but make a more profound impact on society when we succeed. Um, we have a, a governor's election coming up here. Uh, which yes, impacts I've this. heard. Um, any thoughts on, is there an opportunity for a candidate or a party or an initiative or a point of view to help at all in any of this as it relates to health care specifically? Well, it's very interesting. Massachusetts is very interesting because the very centerpiece of the Massachusetts success over the last 20 years has been related to the development of institutions who now are, not through any moral intent of their own, like the personification of the problem. So we are not a little bit overbedded, you know, in terms of inpatient beds. We are massively overbedded. We are not a little bit overpriced. We are hysterically like Kafka, you know, overpriced. Uh, and so, and there are millions and millions of people who work in hairnets and blue smocks, in unions and in organizations of other types, and who vote, who work for those institutions. And so, how does the government pivot? because these institutions are strangling the worker base and the innovation base by making the cost of everything higher than it needs to be, but yet they are the establishment as well. And so how do you, you can't say burn baby burn if you're the governor, you know, bring down Mass General, yeah, you know, not gonna happen. In fact, you'll even let them buy up more people and perfect their monopoly on the South Shore. Uh, Next question, should they have allowed yeah. that merger to, to the Attorney General have said yes They're to that They're so merger? far over the path of sort of government invasion. I mean. The, the things that we could do in Massachusetts, like it's illegal to open up a better product across the street from a hospital. How about we make it not illegal to open up a cheaper hospital across the street from a lame hospital? Like that would really help us with our lame hospital problem. It would put a lot of hospitals out of business, and that is okay. Hospitals going out of business when you're 45% over bed, we have 45% more beds than we actually need if you sort of follow the Dartmouth study, give everybody what they want and pay for it. Like it's okay. It's illegal for doctors to work for companies, even though entrepreneurs do better product management than doctors. There's all kinds of weird laws that have sort of built up, sort of like you can't have beer on Sunday laws or whatever, these weird sort of from another era laws. And so now the government, rather than releasing those laws, is actually trying to say, but also charge less. I'll make you, I'll sue you, I'll investigate you. I'll send my investigators if you don't charge less, which is so, like, not cool. It's sort of a Putin meets Castro kind of, for the people, and I'll, you know, and so nobody's a good guy. There's no way for a, a, a grassroots disruptor to bring justice to the overchargers. Because every time they do these deals, it's harder and harder and harder for, you know, the resultant regulatory deal making is fine for companies like me with 17 lawyers on staff but not good for the dudes at 94 Codman Road who are like, how many minutes is, like, how much can you do in six minutes, you know, yeah. when talking to the law firm? Yeah. Uh, so that's the, I, I see it as, it would be hard, but you'd have to make little pin size holes in the, uh, in the moat, in the walls around the healthcare establishment to allow entrepreneurs uh, or just existing players 
that want to try to be entrepreneurial. And there's a lot of that energy. Steward Healthcare is a, is a venture back. Yeah. They took the struggling Catholic hospitals and turned it into a venture back, you know, PE type play. Um, and now they have a lot of things they're not allowed to do that they want to, like close underperforming hospitals. Uh, but if we let them, like, they do really well. Um, so we probably have five minutes left. Okay. I'm going to try to hit two quick questions, um, which I think we can't contain within five minutes, but we're going to try. Okay. And then I can we try have... the whole like snippy short answer thing. Okay. Like. Give it a shot. All right. Um, will we will we be able to look back and or if we look back in six years, six years from now we look back. 2020. 2020. 2020 vision. This is called. That's right. Um, are we looking at what's what determines that Obamacare? as we will define, as I will use the term, is successful or not to uh, successful. Yeah. The problem when you do, when you make everybody do something, there's no A-B test. So Obamacare will be a success because it'll be measured against whatever we had, which was nothing. And so like, oh, well, everyone was covered. It'll, you know, it, half the people will look at it and say half full, and half the people will look at it and say half empty. And when the mood goes one way, it'll be more than half that are against it. And when the mood goes the other way, it'll be less than half that are against it, right? But because there's no A-B test, there's no people who got to do another thing besides Obamacare, then we'll never know. Um, I, I think in general, my sort of final thought on Obamacare is it didn't do so much harm that you can't still be successful. You, can't, you can still be an entrepreneur in an Obamacare healthcare. And so no excuses. Just okay. get out and do it. And I'll throw in more thing. If we had done a better job as entrepreneurs, Obama wouldn't have done Obamacare. It's only because the marketplace didn't rise up and provide something for the 40 million people who opted out that we had it in the first place. Totally different topic. You're an author now. Yeah, right. What, I paid a guy. Are you kidding me? OK, <laughs> but for, for, the, for the parts that you didn't pay for. I, what, I was the outline, and I was the ranter. What did, right, I so ranted what, on what my What did own. you learn about yourself, yeah. process, rigor? Yeah language, anything. What, what, well, what, I, am a, I am a huge, a passionate fan of rigorous process and rigorous reevaluation of process because my personal management of everything is so bad that I just, I'm in awe of anything that can actually run itself well from day to day. Uh, and so this book was, you know, structured into the calendar. There were certain days for me to meet with Stephen. There were half days, whole days, two hour check-ins, phone calls. Uh, and I was, you know, under a time crunch to get whatever I wanted to get onto the page, onto the page within that structure. And at the end, it was terrifying. I, I came back from my sabbatical with a paper galley, fat with yellow stickies and underlines of the things that I just couldn't bear about the book, that we just had to figure out how to change. Walked into my office with my fat galley, and there was the first hardcover final copy on my desk. Congrats. Uh, so there's a certain. Uh, there's something about everything in our life is so fungible, so editable, so changeable on the fly. We can lean, develop ourselves and what we say and our speeches and our code so continually that forcing yourself into a final statement that will stay still is an incredibly maturing uh, and uh, uh, humbling and valuable, wonderful honor to be able to have had. Do you think you'll do it again? Uh, if everyone buys two copies, <laughs> uh, I will do another. Okay. Um, I do think we might have two or three minutes. If there's a, a one or two questions, sure, go ahead. I think we just restate the yeah. question. If I was in charge of health care, if I was the president choosing directions, I would first choose that presidents don't choose directions for 400 million people. That's what we have now, and that's... That's not human. That's not humanizing. It doesn't give enough personal power to people. They don't feel in charge. They don't feel good. Even if what they get is amazing, it doesn't feel good. I mean, I always felt like world peace foisted on me by force doesn't feel that great, right? Whereas world peace, I know that's extreme. Forget that one. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, when someone forces some, you on something. So if I was, you know, the maximum leader, I would try to make it possible for many, many, many choices, many, many, many ways of the word healthcare to be expressed throughout society. Uh, I think that's the one problem, the biggest single problem we have with healthcare in the United States today is that the word healthcare is now federally litigated down to a very specific definition of an all you can eat buffet of interventions with no mental health and no emotional support groups and no good food. You know, that's, that's the definition of healthcare in the country. And you are not allowed to sell healthcare if it's not that. And, you know, you look at the claims data like sex life, friends at work, mean boss, 
These things correlate to health costs way more than pap smears, mammograms. Mammograms was just shown to have an adverse correlation to health status. Actually bad to get mammograms. Canadian study, look it up. You know, so the idea that some one group, no matter how smart or well-meaning, get to decide what it is, is the thing that we ought to be a little more humble about. A little more like pull back, get a, get a definition that still provides a safety net, but is small enough to allow for a lot of A-B testing, a lot of crazy ones to come and try on kooky stuff and say, guess what, this is my health care, you know, and be okay. Thanks. Oh, we have one. Last more. one. Last one. Right, so the question is what, in the, in the book we talk about, you know, the ignorance economy and how hard it is, the, the patients sort of don't even understand, if they could get financial benefit from making good healthcare choices, how would they even know what choices to make? I believe from an, if you're an entrepreneur watching this, I don't think that the, the step will be from where we are to patients empowered. I think the first step will be caregivers empowered. It'll be entrepreneurs, doctors, hospitals, these kooky clinic types in this book that accumulate, that, that, that have enough deep cuts of clinical knowledge, understand the coding and the referral game and the sophisticated payment picture well enough that they can start to shop and profit from shopping in their patient's behalf. Then the people who are now, you know, trying to get those shopping doctors' attention will need to start doing some product management to explain it to the doctor. And once the doctor gets it to where they understand it, it'll be packaged close enough that the first super consumers will be able to shop for it without the doctor in the middle. But that's, you know, a de the next decade or two is going to be doctors and those in the role of doctor or caregiver learning to shop and to profit from being really good shoppers as, as fiduciaries for their patients. That's the first wave in my opinion. Good. That's a good one to end on. So everybody go, start a company where you're a caregiver shopping for consumers and get onto AthenaNet and we will do your shit work that you hate and suck at. Okay, so uh, <laughs> on that note, uh, Jonathan Bush, uh, author of Where Does It Hurt? For those of you who were too shy to sit in the front row. Uh, you missed we a free have, copy. We, Maybe well, that's why they didn't sit in the front row. Uh, yeah, uh, they, the, let's re try to reserve those for Googlers if we can, please. Sorry, Athenistas. But yeah, I think please. you might get something back. That would be office. weird if we yeah, came, came here and, here and took yeah. their food and their employees <laughs> and the books that so we brought. So Googlers, come <laughs> grab a book. This can be found probably in the next 10 days on our YouTube channel. Um, I think it's at Talks Google is the YouTube channel, but just search for Talks at Google. And uh, really a pleasure to have you oh, here today. Oh, this is great. You so Thank much. you guys Thank all you. very much.